Have you ever stopped to think that the names we know as God and Jesus might not be their true names? A recent investigation has brought these intriguing questions to light. But why were the original names of God and Jesus Christ altered in the Bible? Who was responsible for these changes, and what were their goals in doing so? Let's explore these answers right now. If you have faith in God and His resurrection, take the opportunity to subscribe to the channel. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his hands? Who has wrapped up the waters in his cloak? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name, and what is his son's name? If you know, this riddle found in Proverbs 30 verse 4 challenges us to discover these significant names, questions that many have taken to the grave without answers. Today, you have the chance to uncover this mystery. Here, God declares in Isaiah 42 verse 8, I am Yahweh, that is my name, I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. This verse challenges all humanity, emphasizing the importance of the true name of the Creator and His view on the use of other names. In the Bible, the name of God is highlighted as crucial, appearing about 7,000 times. However, this name has been hidden and removed from public knowledge for many centuries. When examining the prefaces of various Bible translations, one can notice a certain boldness on the part of the translators when addressing the divine name known as the Tetragrammaton. They explained that they opted for a common technique in many English versions, translating the divine name as Lord or God. But what does it really mean when they say they used a technique? Essentially, it's a method developed with a well-defined purpose, a strategy designed to achieve a specific goal. Thus, the translators had a clear intention in representing the Creator's name this way. But what was that purpose or plan? The explanation becomes evident. The primary intention was to alter and replace the true name of the Creator. This decision prevents people from truly knowing the name of God, directly contradicting the truths present in the oldest translations of the Scriptures and what Yahweh Himself revealed about His name. A striking example occurred when Moses, also known as Musa, was on the mountain. He asked the Creator, concerned about what to say to the children of Israel, when I say that the God of your ancestors has sent me, and they asked his name, what should I tell them? This crucial dialogue, found in Exodus 3 verse 13, offers an opportunity for all of us to understand how the Creator responded to Musa. The Creator revealed a profound truth about His nature to Moses, as recorded in Exodus 3 verse 14, I am who I am. He instructed Moses to convey this message to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. The expression I am who I am comes from the Hebrew term that means to be or to exist. With this, the Creator was communicating to Moses that His name reflects His eternal existence, indicating that He always was and always will be. This suggests that for those who follow Him, He is capable of providing everything they need. If you hope for your prayers to be heard, He can listen. If you seek healing, He has the power to heal. If you desire wisdom, He can grant it. If you seek forgiveness, He is ready to forgive. If you yearn for a significant change in your life, He has the ability to make it happen. The name Yahweh carries the power to create what we need through the word spoken in His name. Many are familiar with the phrase, I am who I am, but few reflect on what he says next. In the following verse, he gives a clear instruction, Say to the Israelites, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation, as recorded in Exodus 3 verse 15. The Creator's words are clear and direct, His name is Yahweh, and this is how he will be remembered forever through all generations. If you are listening or watching this, you are part of those generations mentioned. The name Yahweh was, is, and always will be the same. However, the question arises, how could the translators have the audacity to alter this name using what they call a technique? This term technique is nothing more than a polite way of saying that they modified and obscured the divine name. What would Yahweh, the Creator, think of this change? He himself instructs in Deuteronomy 4 verse 2, Do not add to what I command you and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of Yahweh your God that I give you. 
Furthermore, in Proverbs 30 verses 5 to 6, it is written, Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. And in Hebrews 4 verse 12, it states, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Yahweh's word is now, more than ever, revealing the deceptions of the translators that have affected many generations, preventing them from accessing the true blessings and the power that comes from knowing and praising the name of Yahweh, the Most High. This truth echoes the words of the Savior in Matthew 23 verses 13 to 15, where he warns, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You devour widows' houses, and for show make lengthy prayers, therefore you will be condemned more severely. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. The scribes that the Savior referred to are comparable to modern translators, also known as scribes, who replace the divine names with terms like Lord and God. At best, Lord might derive from the Hebrew Edoni, meaning master, a mere description of position. At worst, it could derive from Baal, a pagan deity frequently mentioned in the scriptures. It's possible that this association with Baal influenced modern translators, perhaps under the influence of malevolent forces, to adopt this term. The Encyclopedia Britannica informs us that Baal was a god worshipped by various ancient Middle Eastern communities, particularly the Canaanites, who regarded him as a fertility deity and one of the most important gods in the pantheon. The common Semitic word Baal in Hebrew means owner or lord. Even the slightest possibility of associating the Creator's name with a pagan deity like this seems entirely unacceptable. Let's now consider the word God. At best, it could derive from the Hebrew word Alua, meaning the Mighty One. The plural of this word would be Elohim, meaning the Mighty Ones. These are merely designations that describe someone's position without indicating a proper name. At worst, the word God could come from the Hebrew word Gad or the European words Gut, Goose, or Gat. The Encyclopedia Britannica, in its 11th edition, clarifies the origins of the word God, mentioning that it was a common Teutonic word used to refer to a personal object of religious worship. It was applied to all superhuman beings in pagan mythologies. When the Teutonic peoples converted to Christianity, this word was adopted to denote the one supreme being. The translators and scribes, often warned by the Savior in his critiques, were the ones who chose to replace the Creator's name, Yahweh, with the word God. This change was not trivial, it was a fundamental alteration, substituting the most significant name, the name of the Creator of all, with a more generic and less specific term. The explanation of who is behind this vast deception is detailed in the Scriptures. In Revelation 12 verse 9, we are informed that the great dragon, the ancient serpent known as the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, was cast out of heaven and thrown to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. This passage suggests that the true adversary, the one who would benefit most from hiding the name of the Creator and the Savior and limiting access to the power that the divine name holds, is the very deceiver mentioned in the scriptures, Satan. He, more than anyone else, opposes the knowledge and veneration of the true divine name, which is the key to a deeper and more powerful relationship with the Creator. It is very clear who the adversary mentioned in the scriptures is, known as the devil or Satan. The Bible warns us about him, saying, Woe to the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. Furthermore, when the dragon was cast down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to a male child. This is written in the book of Revelation 12 verses 12 to 13. Reflect on how the devil has led some to hide and distort the truth. Imagine this, the most significant word was hidden for many, many years, of the Jewish God Yahweh. The vision concludes with Paul reaching the tenth heaven and meeting fellow spirits. A verse from the Gospel of Judas adds to the mystery.
Truly I say to you, the stars complete all these things. When Soclus completes the time that's been determined for him, their first star will appear with the generations, and they'll finish what's been said. Then they'll sleep around in my name and murder their children. GOJ page 54 This highly symbolic message might refer to celestial roles in apocalyptic events, with Soclus being another name for the Demiurge. The murdering of children could symbolize the spiritual decline of future generations. The origins of these Gnostic texts are debated. One theory is that they were hidden by a Gnostic community in Egypt during the 4th century to protect them from Orthodox Christian destruction. Others believe they were deliberately preserved to transmit Gnostic teachings to future generations. Some scholars suggest that the texts were intended for a select group of initiates, while others see them as part of a mythological storytelling tradition influenced by Eastern religions like Zoroastrianism and Buddhism. Gnosticism is generally thought to have Jewish Christian roots, with some texts violently rejecting the Jewish God. Paul's teachings in early Christianity may have contributed to Gnostic ideas, emphasizing the separation of the spirit from the flawed physical world. There are also theories that Gnostic writings were created by secret societies like the Knights Templar or Freemasons, but there is no substantial evidence for this. In summary, whether these texts are hidden codes or relics of a past doctrine remains uncertain. Nonetheless, their discovery offers a fascinating glimpse into a complex and largely forgotten Did you know that some of the most powerful teachings of Jesus were hidden away for centuries? Imagine discovering ancient secrets that could change the way you see the world. What if there was knowledge that could unlock the secret of life? Wouldn't you want to know more about it? In 1945, in the sands of Egypt, workers unearthed a treasure that would astonish the world. Thirteen leather-bound manuscripts revealing the lost teachings of the Gnostic Christians. These early followers of Jesus believed in salvation through mystical knowledge, but their secrets were buried by the Roman Orthodox Church, which sought to destroy their writings and their followers. Now, to truly understand these ancient secrets, we need to look at the work of Dolores Cannon, a pioneering hypnotherapist and author who spent her life exploring human consciousness. In her book, They Walked with Jesus, she explores topics like past lives, the afterlife, and the hidden knowledge of ancient civilizations. Her work connects with the teachings we're about to show you now, providing a bridge between modern understanding and ancient wisdom. Let's get started. So, what did these ancient manuscripts reveal? Among the most intriguing finds was the Gospel of Thomas, a collection of 114 secret sayings of Jesus. Unlike the familiar stories from the Bible, these sayings are like a direct line to Jesus' teachings, offering insights into the power of thought, emotion, and the hidden language of the heart. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus said, When you make the two one, you will become the sons of man, and when you say, Mountain, move away, it will move away. This saying hints at a profound truth. Within us lies the power to change our reality, to move mountains with our words and beliefs. The Gnostics were a unique group within early Christianity, offering insights that differed significantly from mainstream beliefs. However, their views were seen as a threat by the Roman Orthodox Church. In a ruthless campaign to establish religious uniformity, the Church sought to erase Gnostic teachings. Many Gnostic writings were destroyed, and their followers faced persecution, often being burned at the stake. If you're fascinated by mysteries from the past and how they connect to our present, I invite you to be part of our community by subscribing to this channel. The year 325 AD marked a pivotal moment in this historical saga. Emperor Constantine, a powerful figure in the early Christian church, convened the First Council of Nicaea. One of the council's major outcomes was the consolidation of Christian doctrine and the formation of what we now recognize as the Bible. During this process, a staggering amount of information was either excluded or heavily edited. Scholars estimate that around 45 books were either removed entirely or altered significantly. This decision reshaped the Christian tradition, leaving out numerous teachings that might have offered a more diverse understanding of Jesus' messages. For centuries, these teachings remained hidden, hinting at a different kind of Jesus, one who taught about the interconnectedness of all things and the power of human emotion. For instance, in one of the sayings, Jesus states, whoever finds the interpretations of these sayings will not experience death. 
This and other sayings suggest a deeper, mystical approach to spirituality, emphasizing personal enlightenment and inner peace. The discovery of the Nag Hammadi Library, which included the Gospel of Thomas, reignited interest in these forgotten teachings. Alongside other significant finds like the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Coptic texts, these manuscripts provide evidence that much valuable information was lost over the centuries. The reemergence of these texts has allowed scholars and spiritual seekers to piece together a more comprehensive understanding of early Christian thought. One of the most intriguing aspects of the Gospel is its emphasis on self-discovery and inner wisdom. The text starts with a powerful declaration. These are the secret sayings that the living Jesus spoke and Didymus Judas Thomas recorded. This introduction sets the tone for a series of teachings that challenge the reader to look within for answers. A central theme is the concept of enlightenment through personal understanding. For example, in verse 1, Jesus says, Whoever finds the meaning of these words will not taste death. This statement suggests that true knowledge and spiritual awakening can lead to eternal life. It encourages individuals to seek deeper truths and connect with their inner selves. Another key saying is found in verse 2. Jesus said, Let him who seeks continue seeking until he finds. When he finds, he will be troubled. When he becomes troubled, he will be astonished, and he will rule over all. This passage highlights the transformative journey of self-discovery. It acknowledges that seeking the truth can be a challenging and unsettling process. But ultimately, it leads to a profound realization and empowerment. It also explores the idea of unity and harmony within oneself. In verse 48, Jesus teaches, If two make peace with each other in this one house, they will say to the mountain, Move from here, and it will move. This saying underscores the power of inner peace and balance. When we reconcile conflicting parts of ourselves, we can achieve extraordinary things. Verse 106 expands on this idea, When you make the two one, you will become the sons of man. And when you say, Mountain, move away, it will move away. Here, Jesus speaks about the unification of dualities within us. By merging our inner contradictions and achieving harmony, we tap into a profound source of power and potential. The Gospel of Thomas often emphasizes the importance of understanding the interconnectedness of all things. In verse 77, Jesus says, I am the light that is above all things. I am all. From me, all came forth, and to me, all attained. Split a piece of wood, I am there. Lift up the stone, and you will find me there. This profound saying suggests that the divine presence is everywhere and in everything. It encourages us to see the sacred and the mundane and recognize our connection to the divine. If you found this journey meaningful, please consider supporting our channel with a super thanks. Your support helps us continue to bring you more insights into ancient wisdom and spiritual mysteries. Moreover, the Gospel of Thomas challenges conventional religious practices and encourages a direct, personal experience of the divine. For instance, in verse 113, his disciples said to him, When will the kingdom come? Jesus said, It will not come by waiting for it. It will not be a matter of saying, Here it is, or there it is. Rather, the kingdom of the Father is spread out upon the earth, and men do not see it. This teaching reveals that the divine realm is not a distant place to be awaited, but a present reality to be realized. By exploring these key concepts, we see that the Gospel of Thomas offers a unique and profound perspective on Jesus' teachings. It emphasizes personal enlightenment, inner peace, and the recognition of the divine within and around us. These teachings challenge us to embark on a journey of self-discovery, to seek deeper truths, and to find the divine presence in every aspect of our lives. One of the core philosophical messages is the power of thought and emotion in shaping our reality. This idea is reflected in the teachings that emphasize the importance of inner harmony and unified intention. For instance, when Jesus speaks about making the two one and moving mountains, he is highlighting the immense potential that lies in aligning our thoughts and feelings. This concept suggests that our inner world has a direct impact on the external world, a notion that resonates with many modern spiritual and psychological theories. 
Another significant insight is the emphasis on self-awareness and personal enlightenment. The sayings encourage us to seek within ourselves for truth and understanding. This introspective approach contrasts with the more external, ritualistic practices often associated with religion. By turning inward and exploring our own consciousness, we can access a deeper connection with the divine. This idea is particularly evident in the saying, whoever finds the meaning of these words will not taste death, suggesting that true knowledge and spiritual awakening can transcend the limitations of our physical existence. It also challenges us to see the divine in all things. The saying, split a piece of wood, I am there, lift up the stone, and you will find me there, urges us to recognize that the sacred is present in every aspect of the world around us. This perspective fosters a sense of reverence for life and encourages us to look beyond the surface to find deeper spiritual truths. It aligns with the philosophical notion that all of creation is interconnected and that by understanding this connection, we can experience a greater sense of unity and purpose. The philosophical insights also extend to the nature of prayer and intention. Traditional views of prayer often involve asking for things from an external deity. However, the teachings in this gospel suggest that effective prayer comes from aligning our thoughts and emotions with our desires, essentially creating a state where we feel as if our prayers have already been answered. This approach to prayer is about cultivating a mindset of gratitude and certainty, which can lead to a more profound and fulfilling spiritual practice. In exploring these philosophical teachings, we see that the Gospel of Thomas offers a rich and transformative understanding of spirituality. It challenges us to look within, recognize the divine in all things, and understand the power of our thoughts and emotions in shaping our reality. These insights not only deepen our spiritual awareness, but also provide practical guidance for living a more conscious and intentional life. One of the most compelling lessons from these teachings is the power of our inner world. By aligning our thoughts and emotions, we can influence our reality in ways we never thought possible. This understanding encourages us to take responsibility for our own spiritual journey, seeking enlightenment and inner peace through self-awareness and introspection.